If you follow The Secret Sits on Instagram, you may have noticed in the five quick facts about me that Jodie Foster is my all-time favorite actor. But there is one person whose infatuation with the actor almost caused the assassination of the President of the United States of America. I am, of course, talking about John Hinckley Jr. And even though Jody almost never speaks of the horrid time in her life, we are going to cover it here today. I'm John Dodson. Welcome to The Secret Sense. John Warnock Hinckley was the chairman and president of the Vanderbilt Energy Corporation. Now, the Vanderbilt Energy Corporation was a small but successful oil and gas exploration company. The company was started on May 1, 1975, and over the company's first five years, it enjoyed steady and impressive growth producing record financial and drilling results in 1980 that have made its stocks one of the highest dollar volume issues in the -the over-the-counter market. But the executive credited with shaping Vanderbilt's aggressive drilling program, John Warnock Hinckley Sr., had to announce that he would give up his day-to-day management role because of family problems. The company's shares dropped $1 to $12.75 after the announcement. Mr. Hinckley's decision came the day after the shooting of President Ronald Reagan and the disclosure that Mr. Hinckley's son, John Jr., had been charged as the assailant. John Warnock Hinckley Jr. was born in Admore, Oklahoma, and moved with his wealthy family to Dallas, Texas at the age of four. His mother was named Joanne Hinckley. Hinckley grew up in University Park, Texas, and attended Highland Park High School in Dallas County. After Hinckley graduated from high school in 1973, his family, owners of the Hinckley Oil Company, moved to Evergreen, Colorado, where the new company headquarters were located. He became an off-again-and-on-again student at Texas Tech University from 1974 to 1980, but eventually dropped out. In 1975, he went to Los Angeles in the hopes of becoming a songwriter. His efforts were unsuccessful, and he wrote to his parents with tales of misfortune and pleas for money. In his letters, he also spoke of a girlfriend named Lynn Collins, who turned out to be a fabrication of John's imagination. In September of 1976, he returned to his parents' home in Evergreen. Then, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Hinckley began purchasing weapons and starting to practice with them. He was also prescribed antidepressants, and tranquilizers to deal with some of his emotional problems. In 1976, the amazing film titled Taxi Driver was released. Now, if you have not seen this movie yet, I suggest you find it and watch it as soon as possible. Taxi Driver is an American film directed by Martin Scorsese, written by Paul Schrader, and starring Robert De Niro, Jodie Foster, Sybil Shepard, Harvey Keitel, Peter Boyle, Leonard Harris, and Albert Brooks. I mean, just look at the cast list. It is set in a decaying and morally bankrupt New York City following the Vietnam War. The film follows Travis Bickle, expertly played by Robert De Niro, who is a taxi driver and veteran and his deteriorating mental state as he works nights in the city. Scorsese wanted the film to feel like a dream state to the audience. Filming began in the summer of 1975 in New York City, with actors voluntarily taking pay cuts to ensure that the project 
could be completed on a low budget of $1.9 million. Production concluded that same year, with a score being composed by Bernard Herrmann in his final score before his death. The film Taxi Driver is dedicated to him. The film was theatrically released by Columbia Pictures on February 8, 1976, where it was a critical and commercial success, despite generating controversy for its graphic violence at the climactic ending and the casting of then 12-year-old acting prodigy Jodie Foster in the role of a child sex worker. Taxi Driver is still considered one of the greatest films ever made. The film received numerous accolades, including the 1976 Cannes Film Festival's Palme d'Or, the highest honor given at the ceremony, and four nominations at the 49th Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Actor for De Niro, Best Supporting Actress for Jodie Foster. Hinckley became obsessed with the film, in which the disturbed protagonist, Travis Bickle, plots to assassinate a presidential candidate. Bickle was partly based on the diaries of Arthur Bremer, who, in 1972, attempted to assassinate Democratic presidential candidate George Wallace. Hinckley developed an infatuation with Jodie Foster, who played sexually trafficked 12-year-old child Iris Stensma in the film. When Foster entered the drama department at Yale University in 1980, Hinckley moved to New Haven, Connecticut for a short time and began stalking her. There, he slipped poems and messages under Foster's door and repeatedly called her and left her messages. Failing to develop any meaningful sort of contact with Foster, Hinckley fantasized about conducting an aircraft hijacking or committing suicide in front of Foster to get her attention. Eventually, he settled on a scheme to impress her by assassinating the President of the United States, thinking that by achieving a place in history, he would appeal to her as her equal. Hinckley trailed President Jimmy Carter from state to state and was arrested in Nashville, Tennessee on a firearms charge. Penniless, he returned home. Despite psychiatric treatment for depression, his mental health did not improve. He began to target the newly elected president, Ronald Reagan, in 1981. For this purpose, he collected material on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Hinckley wrote this to Foster just before his assassination attempt on Reagan's life. Over the past seven months, I've left you dozens of poems, letters, and love messages in the faint hope that you could develop an interest in me. Although we talked on the phone a couple of times, I never had the nerve to simply approach you and introduce myself. The reason I'm going ahead with this attempt now is because I cannot wait any longer to impress you. Signed, John Hinckley Jr. On March 28th, Hinckley arrived in Washington, D.C. by bus and checked into the Park Central Hotel. He originally intended to continue on to New Haven in another attempt to meet Jodie Foster. He noticed Reagan's schedule that was published in the Washington Star and decided it was time to act. Hinckley knew that he might be killed during the assassination attempt, and he wrote but did not mail a letter to Foster about two hours prior to his attempt on the president's life. In the letter, he said that he hoped to impress her with the magnitude of his action and that he would abandon the idea of getting Reagan in a second if he could only win your heart and live out the rest of my life with you. On March 30th, Reagan delivered a luncheon address to AFL-CIO representatives at the Washington Hilton. 
the Secret Service was very familiar with the hotel, having inspected it more than a hundred times for presidential visits since the early 1970s. The Hilton was considered the safest venue in Washington because of its secure, enclosed passageway called the President's Walk. Built after the 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy, Reagan entered the building through the passageway at about 1.45 p.m., waving to a crowd of news media and citizens. The Secret Service had required him to wear a bulletproof vest for some events, but Reagan was not wearing one for this speech, because his only public exposure would be the 30 feet between the hotel and his limousine and the agency did not require vests for agents that day. No one saw Hinckley behaving in an unusual way. Witnesses who reported him as fidgety and agitated apparently confused Hinckley with another person that the Secret Service had been monitoring. At 2.27 p.m., Reagan exited the hotel through President's Walk on Florida Avenue where reporters waited. He left the T Street Northwest exit towards his waiting limousine as Hinckley waited within the crowd of admirers. The Secret Service had extensively screened those attending the president's speech, but greatly erred by allowing an unscreened group to stand within 15 feet of the president behind a rope line. The agency uses multiple layers of protection. Local police in the outer layer briefly check people. Secret Service agents in the middle layer check for weapons. And more agents form the inner layer immediately around the president. Hinckley somehow penetrated the first two layers of protection. As several hundred people applauded Reagan, the president unexpectedly passed right in front of Hinckley. Reporters standing behind a rope barricade 20 feet away ask questions. As Mike Putzel of the Associated Press shouted, Mr. President! Hinckley, believing he would never get a better chance, assumed a crouched position and rapidly fired a ROM RG-14 Luger Blue Steel revolver six times in 1.7 seconds missing the president with all six shots. The first round hit White House Press Secretary James Brady in the head above his left eye, passing through underneath his brain and shattering his brain cavity. The small explosive charge in the round exploded on impact. District of Columbia police officer Thomas Delahanty recognized the sound as the gunshot and turned his head sharply to the left to identify the shooter. As he did so, he was struck in the back of his neck by the second shot. The bullet ricocheted off of his spine. Delahanty fell on top of Brady, screaming, I am hit. Hinckley now had a clear shot at the president, but Alfred Antonucci a Cleveland, Ohio labor official who was standing nearby saw Hinckley fire the first two shots and hit him in the head and began to wrestle him to the ground. Upon hearing the shots, special agent in charge Jerry Parr almost instantly grabbed Reagan by the shoulders and dove with him toward the open rear door of the limousine. Agent Ray Shattuck trailed just behind Parr to assist in throwing both men into the car. The third round overshot the president, instead hitting the window of a building across the street. Parr's actions likely saved Reagan from being hit in the head. As Parr pushed Reagan into the limousine, Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy snapped his attention towards the sound of the gunfire, pivoting to his right and putting himself into the line of fire. McCarthy spread his arms and legs, taking a wide stance directly in front of Reagan and Parr to make himself a target. 
McCarthy was struck in the lower abdomen by the fourth round, the bullet traversing his right lung, diaphragm, and right lobe of the liver. The fifth round hit the bullet-resistant glass of the window on the open rear door of the limousine as Reagan and Parr were passing behind it. The sixth and final bullet ricocheted off of the armored side of the limousine, passed between the space of the open rear door and the vehicle frame, and hit the president in the left underarm. The round grazed a rib and lodged into his lung, causing it to partially collapse before stopping less than an inch from his heart. Within moments of the first shots, Secret Service agent Dennis McCarthy, no relation to agent Timothy McCarthy, dove across the sidewalk and landed directly on Hinckley as others pushed him to the ground. Another Cleveland area labor official, Frank J. McNamara, joined Antonucci and started punching Hinckley in the head, striking him so hard he drew blood. Agent McCarthy later reported that he had to strike two citizens to force them to release Hinckley. Secret Service agent Robert Wanko deployed an Uzi submachine gun concealed in a briefcase to cover the president's evacuation and to deter a potential group attack. The day after the shooting, Hinckley's gun was given to the ATF, which traced its origin. In just 16 minutes, agents found that the gun had been purchased at Rocky's Pawn Shop in Dallas, Texas. It had been loaded with six Devastator brand cartridges, which contained small aluminum and lead azide explosive charges designed to explode on contact. The bullet that hit Brady was the only one that exploded. On April 2nd, after learning that the others could explode at any time, volunteer doctors wearing bulletproof vests removed the bullet from Delahanty's neck. After the Secret Service first announced shots fired over its radio network at 2.27 p.m., Reagan, codenamed Rawhide, was taken by the agents in the limousine, codenamed Stagecoach. No one knew that Reagan had been shot. After Parr searched Reagan's body and found no blood, he stated that Rawhide is okay, we're going to Crown, which was the code name for the White House, as he preferred its medical facilities to an unsecured hospital. Reagan was in great pain from the bullet that struck his rib and believed his rib had cracked when Parr pushed him into the limousine. When the agent checked him for gunshot wounds, however, Reagan coughed up blood, frothy blood. Although the president believed he had just cut his lip, Parr believed that the cracked rib had punctured Reagan's lung and ordered the motorcade to divert to nearby George Washington University Hospital, which the Secret Service periodically inspected for use. The limousine arrived there less than four minutes after leaving the hotel while other agents took Hinckley to a D.C. jail, and Nancy Reagan, codenamed Rainbow, left the White House for the hospital. Although Parr had requested a stretcher, none were ready at the hospital, and it did not normally keep a stretcher at the emergency department entrance. Reagan exited the limousine and insisted on walking. Reagan acted casually, and smiled at onlookers as he walked in. While he entered the hospital unassisted, once inside, the president complained of difficulty breathing, and his knees buckled, and he went down to one knee. Parr and others assisted him into the emergency department. The physicians to the president, Daniel Rube, had been near Reagan during the shooting and arrived in a separate car. Believing that the president might have had a heart attack, he insisted that the hospital's trauma team, and not himself or specialists from elsewhere, operate on him as they would have any other patient. When a hospital employee 
asked Reagan's aide Michael Deaver for the patient's name and address. Only when Deaver stated 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue did the worker realize that the President of the United States was in the emergency department. The medical team, led by Joseph Giordano, cut off Reagan's thousand-dollar custom-made suit to examine him. Reagan complained about the cost of the ruined suit, which was cited by an assistant in a press briefing to reassure the public that the president was in stable health. Military officials, including the one who carried the nuclear football, unsuccessfully tried to prevent FBI agents from confiscating the suit, Reagan's wallet, and other possessions as evidence. The gold codes card was in the wallet, and the FBI did not return it until two days later. The medical personnel found that Reagan's systolic blood pressure was 60 compared to the normal 140, indicating that he was in shock and knew that most 70-year-olds in the president's condition would not survive. Reagan was in excellent physical health, however, and also was shot by the 22 caliber instead of a larger 38 that was first feared. They treated him with intravenous fluids, oxygen, tetanus, toxoid, and chest tubes, and surprised Parr, who still believed that he had cracked the president's rib, by finding the entrance of a gunshot wound. Brady and the wounded agent McCarthy were operated on near the president. When his wife arrived in the emergency department, Reagan remarked to her, Honey, I forgot to duck, borrowing boxer Jack Dempsey's line to his wife the night he was beaten by Gene Tunney. While intubated, he scribbled to a nurse, All in all, I'd rather be in Philadelphia, borrowing a line from W.C. Fields. Although Reagan came close to death, the team's quick action and Parr's decision to drive to the hospital instead of the White House likely saved the president's life. And within 30 minutes, Reagan left the emergency department for surgery with normal blood pressure. The chief of thoracic surgery, Benjamin L. Aaron, decided to perform a thoracotomy lasting 105 minutes because of the bleeding persisting. Ultimately, Reagan lost over half of his blood volume in the emergency department and during surgery, which removed the bullet. In the operating room, Reagan removed his oxygen mask to joke, I hope you're all Republicans. The doctors and nurses laughed, and Giordano, a Democrat, replied, Today, Mr. President, we are all Republicans. Reagan's post-operative course was complicated by a fever, which was treated with antibiotics. His entering the operating room conscious and not in shock, and the surgery being routine, caused Reagan's doctors and others to predict that he would be able to leave the hospital in two weeks, return to work in the Oval Office in a month, and completely heal in six to eight weeks with no long-term effects. With regards to Jodie Foster, this incident attracted intense media attention, and she was accompanied by bodyguards while on campus. Although Judge Barrington D. Parker confirmed that Foster was completely innocent in the case and had been unwittingly ensnared, in a third party's alleged attempt to assassinate an American president, her videotaped testimony was played at Hinckley's trial. While at Yale, Foster also had other stalkers, including a man who planned to kill her, but changed his mind after watching her perform in one of her college plays. The experience was difficult for Foster, and she has rarely commented publicly about it. In the aftermath of the events, she wrote an essay, Why Me?, which was published in 1982 by Esquire magazine on the condition that there be no cover lines, no publicity, and no photos. 
1991, she canceled an interview with NBC's Today Show when she discovered Hinckley would be mentioned in the introduction, and the producers were unwilling to change it. She discussed Hinckley with Charlie Rose of 60 Minutes, too, in 1999, explaining that she does not like to dwell on it too much. I never wanted to be the actress who was remembered for that event, because it didn't have anything to do with me. I was kind of a hapless bystander. But what a scarring, strange moment in history for me to be 17 years old or 18 years old and to be caught up in a drama like that. She stated that the incident had a major impact on her career choices and acknowledged that her experience was minimal compared to the suffering of Reagan's press secretary, James Brady, who was permanently disabled in the shooting and died as a result of his injuries 33 years later, and his loved ones. Whatever bad moments that I had certainly could never compare to that family, Foster said. At his 1982 trial in Washington, D.C., having been charged with 13 offenses, John Hinckley Jr. was found not guilty by reason of insanity on June 21st. The defense psychiatric reports portrayed Hinckley as insane, while the prosecution reports characterized him as legally sane. Hinckley was transferred into psychiatric care from the borough of prison's custody on August 18, 1981. Soon after his trial, Hinckley wrote that the shooting was the greatest love offering in the history of the world and was disappointed that Foster did not reciprocate his love. The verdict resulted in widespread dismay. As a consequence, the United States Congress and a number of states revised laws governing when a defendant may use the insanity defense in a criminal prosecution. Idaho, Montana, and Utah abolished the defense altogether. In the United States, before the Hinckley case, the insanity defense had been used in less than 2% of all felony cases and was unsuccessful in almost 75% of those trials. Public outcry over the verdict led to the Insanity Defense Reform Act of 1984, which altered the rules for consideration of mental illness of defendants in federal criminal court proceedings. In 1985, Hinckley's parents wrote Breaking Points, a book detailing their son's mental condition. Changes in federal and some state rules of evidence laws have since excluded or restricted the use of testimony of an expert witness, such as a psychologist or psychiatrist, regarding conclusions on ultimate issues in insanity defense cases, including whether a criminal defendant is legally insane. But this is not the rule in most states. Vincent J. Fuller, an attorney who represented Hinckley during his trial and for several years afterwards, said Hinckley has schizophrenia. Park Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist who testified for the prosecution, diagnosed Hinckley with narcissistic and schizoid personality disorders, as well as borderline and passive-aggressive features. At the hospital, Hinckley was treated for narcissistic and schizotypal personality disorders and major depressive disorders. Hinckley was confined to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. After Hinckley was admitted, tests found that he was an unpredictably dangerous man who might harm himself or any third party. In 1983, he told Penthouse Magazine that on a normal day, he would see a therapist, answer mail, play guitar, listen to music play pool, watch television, 
eat lousy food, and take delicious medication. Around 1987, Hinckley applied for a court order allowing him periodic home visits. As part of the consideration of the request, the judge ordered Hinckley's hospital room searched. Hospital officials found photographs and letters in Hinckley's room that showed a continued obsession with Foster, as well as evidence that Hinckley had exchanged letters with serial killer Ted Bundy and sought the address of the incarcerated Charles Manson, who had inspired Lynette Squeaky Fromm to try and kill the President of the United States, Gerald Ford. Based on this, the court denied Hinckley's request for additional privileges. After this, in 1990, legendary Broadway composer Stephen Sondheim premiered his new musical, Assassins, on Broadway. In the show, all about U.S. president assassins, or would-be assassins, Sondheim has a scene and a song between John Hinckley Jr. and Lynette Squeaky Fromm. Although the piece is a duet, the two characters are not singing to one another. Hinckley is singing to Jodie Foster, and Fromm is singing to Charles Manson. The lyrics written for the actor playing Hinckley include the phrase, I am unworthy of your love, Jody, Jody. Let me prove worthy of your love. Tell me how I can earn your love. Set me free. How can I turn your love to me? In 1999, Hinckley was permitted to leave the hospital for supervised visits with his parents. In April of 2000, the hospital recommended allowing unsupervised releases, but a month later, they removed the request. Hinckley was allowed supervised visits with his parents again during 2004 and 2005. Court hearings were held in September of 2005 on whether he could have expanded privileges to leave the hospital. On December 30th of 2005, a federal judge ruled that Hinckley would be allowed visits supervised by his parents to their home in Williamsburg, Virginia. The judge ruled that Hinckley could have up to three visits of three nights and then four visits of four nights, each depending on the successful completion of the last. All of the experts who testified at Hinckley's 2005 conditional release hearing, including the government experts, agreed that his depression and psychotic disorder were in full remission and that he should have some expanded conditions of release. In 2007, Hinckley requested further freedoms, including two one-week visits with his parents and a month-long visit. U.S. District Judge Paul L. Friedman denied that request on June 6, 2007. On June 17, 2009, Judge Friedman ruled that Hinckley would be permitted to visit his mother for one dozen visits of 10 days at a time, rather than six, to spend more time outside of the hospital and to have a driver's license. The court also ordered that Hinckley be required to carry a GPS-enabled cell phone to track him wherever he was outside of his parents' home. He was prohibited from speaking with any news media. The prosecutors objected to this ruling, saying Hinckley was still a danger to others and had unhealthy and inappropriate thoughts about women. Hinckley recorded a song called Ballad of an Outlaw, which the prosecutors claim is reflecting suicide and lawlessness. In March of 2011, it was reported that a forensic psychologist at the hospital testified that Hinckley has recovered to the point that he poses no imminent risk of danger to himself or others. 
On March 29, 2011, the day before the 30th anniversary of the assassination attempt, Hinckley's attorney filed a court petition requesting more freedom for his client, including additional unsupervised visits to the Virginia home of Hinckley's mother, Joanne. On November 30th of 2011, a hearing in Washington was held to consider whether he could live full-time outside of the hospital. The Justice Department opposed this, stating that Hinckley still posed a danger to the public. Justice Department counsel argued that Hinckley had been known to deceive his doctors in the past. By December of 2013, the court ordered that visits be extended to his mother, who lived near Williamsburg. Hinckley was permitted up to eight 17-day-long visits, with evaluation after the completion of each one. August 4th, 2014, James Brady died. As Hinckley had critically wounded Brady in 1981, the death was ruled a homicide. Hinckley did not face charges as a result of Brady's death because he had been found not guilty of the original crime by reason of insanity. In addition, since Brady's death occurred more than 33 years after the shooting, prosecution of Hinckley was barred under the year-and-a-day law in effect from the District of Columbia at the time of the shooting. On July 27, 2016, a federal judge ruled that Hinckley could be released from St. Elizabeth's on August 5th, as he was no longer considered a threat to himself or others. Hinckley was released from institutional psychiatric care on September 10th, 2016, with many conditions. He was required to live full-time at his mother's home in Williamsburg. And this is where he stayed for the past five years. Hinckley volunteered to do landscaping at a Unitarian church, and he worked in the library and cafeteria of a psychiatric hospital. He also took up bowling attended lectures and concerts, and exercised at a community center. A federal judge agreed on Monday, September 27, 2021, to lift all remaining restrictions on John Hinckley Jr., who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan in 1981. Next year, if he stays mentally stable, and continues to follow the conditions that he has been living under, prosecutors said. Judge Paul L. Feindman, during a hearing in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, said he would issue his written order on the plan this week. If he hadn't tried to kill the president, he would have been unconditionally released a long, long, long time ago. The Associated Press quoted the judge as saying during the hearing, But everybody is comfortable now after all of the studies, all of the analysis, and all of the interviews, and all of the experience with Mr. Hinckley. At the hearing, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia said it would agree to Mr. Hinckley's unconditional release in June of 2022 if he continues to comply with the conditions of his current release order and maintains his mental stability between now and then, Bill Miller, a spokesman for the office, said in a statement. Barry Levin, a lawyer for Mr. Hinckley, now 66, said in a telephone interview that he and prosecutors had agreed before the hearing on the unconditional release and that Judge Friedman granted their joint request. He said the reason to wait until June was related to two major events in Mr. Hinckley's life. Mr. Hinckley's mother died in July, and his therapist is retiring in January 2022. The court wants to see how he does 
Mr. Levin said. For the decision to be reviewed again would require prosecutors to file a new motion and show that previous terms of the release had been violated, such as traveling more than 75 miles from Williamsburg, Virginia, without telling the court. It is self-executing, Mr. Levin said. The judge will pick what day it will be. I would like to end this episode with the ending passage from Jodie Foster's essay, Why Me?, from Esquire magazine. Someday, I will look back and muse upon the curiosities of history, acting and politics all mixed up together. Anything's possible in a world in which media rules all. But for the time being, the wounds still ache. The battle goes on. It seems that things calm down just as you think you can't take any more. Then something else happens, some new event, and I find myself taking it once again. A stranger will approach me in the street and say, Ain't you the girl who shot the president? I'm John Dodson. This has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Lay.